Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 12. And we'll be reading the entire chapter together, verses 1 through 25. We're going to be learning today about how King Herod persecuted the church in Jerusalem. You'll recall about 10 years before this chapter, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem after the death of Stephen. And now we see in chapter 12, uh, things are not getting easier, uh, they are not getting better, but the persecution is intensifying in Jerusalem. And we see the second martyrdom in the book of Acts in this chapter with the martyrdom of James, the brother of John. Remember, there was Zebedee, and he had two sons, James and John. They were disciples. And Peter, James, and John were part of the inner three who were very close to Jesus. And this chapter tells us about how James was beheaded and how Peter was imprisoned, and yet how King Jesus caused his church to march on and continue to spread the gospel. So it's a pretty powerful chapter. Let's stand as we read it. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 25. Uh, let's be reminded that this is God's inspired, inerrant, infallible, and life-giving word. And let us pray that the Holy Spirit falls upon us and gives us a hunger for the word of God in this church so that people want to hear the preaching of the word and have a hunger for learning more about Jesus through the preaching of the book. Let's hear God's word. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on those who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Now this James obviously is a different James than the one who was beheaded at the beginning of the passage. But this James is referring to the half-brother of Jesus who became a disciple of Jesus after Jesus uh, rose from the dead. Uh, this is the James uh, that's being spoken of there. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea, Caesarea, 
and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord, and after having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God and not a man! Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. This is God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fall afresh on us, give us a desire to learn of your word, and to be encouraged by King Jesus, who has been building his church from the very beginning, a church that has been persecuted by all the powers of hell, and yet a church that has survived even to this day, a church that continues to proclaim the gospel, and a church that overcomes even the most aggressive and violent attack by evil men. We pray, Lord, that you would open up our eyes to the lessons that are in this passage, encourage our hearts, and help us to live passionately for Jesus in this dark, dark day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please be seated? In the 16th century, uh, a man named John Fox wrote a classic book, a book that became a classic, called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Now, if you've never read Fox's Book of Martyrs, I highly recommend that you do. Because in this book, Fox begins with the time of Christ and the apostles. And he goes through all the persecutions that the church faced all the way up to the 16th century. John Fox was a Protestant in England, and so he also covers the way the Protestant gospel preachers were martyred. At the beginning of Fox's Book of Martyrs, he says something interesting about Christ and his prophecy in Matthew 16. Remember, Jesus had asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? They had given different reasons. And then Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then Jesus says, and you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, at the beginning of Fox's book of martyrs, he talks about that prophecy of Christ. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he says three things we should note about that prophecy. First, Christ will have a church in this world. Second, the same church should be mightily impugned, not only by the world, but also by the uttermost strength and powers of all hell. Third, that this church, notwithstanding the uttermost of the devil and all his malice should continue. And sure enough, as you read through the book of Acts and as you read through Fox's book of martyrs, you see that Satan is continually persecuting the church. Satan is continue attack, attacking the church. And yet nothing can stop the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. And we see that yet again here in Acts chapter 12 as King Herod is persecuting the church in Jerusalem. And we see in this passage how King Herod has his day. God permits King Herod to persecute the Christians there for a season. But even though King Herod has his day, God has his way in the end. And Herod comes under judgment, and the kingdom continues to march forward. And we learn a lesson here that is illustrated throughout the whole Bible, and that is that evil rulers may have their day, but God will have his way in the end. 
Even though it appears like Satan is winning, even though it appears like Satan is snuffing out gospel light, killing Christians, God's church will last because Christ has prophesied that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Fox's three observations are true. Christ will have a church in this world. That church will be attacked by all the machinations of the evil one. Yet that church will long endure. We sing in the great hymn, The Church is One Foundation. The church will never perish. Her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish. He is with her to the end. The church will never perish because Christ cannot be a liar. And he will build his church and it will fill the earth. In our passage today, I want you to notice the way it unfolds. First of all, notice here in the first four verses how we see the ongoing presence of persecution in those first four verses. Uh, we see here King Herod is laying violent hands on some of those who belonged to the church. Now, we know the Herods, uh, if you've studied the New Testament, the Herods, uh, all of them were a violent family who ruled as puppet kings in the land of Judea and Palestine. We know about Herod the Great. Uh, Herod the Great was the one who had all the babies killed at the time Jesus was born. And we often read about that in Matthew chapter 2 during Christmas time. Well, this Herod was Herod Agrippa I, who was the grandson of Herod the Great. And he too was violent, and he too was powerful, and he too was one who was put in position of power by the Rome, Romans and who wanted to keep the Jews happy so that the Romans would not remove him from power. He was also the nephew of Herod Antipas. You remember Herod Antipas from the trial of Jesus. Jesus appears before him during his trial. Herod Antipas was also the one who executed John the Baptist. But this is Herod Agrippa, and he is violent, and you see his methods here. He, he is using two different methods that evil rulers often use. You see he is uh, killing Christians. He kills James, the brother of John, with the sword. That means he beheaded him. And he is imprisoning Christians to try to stop the spread of this new Messianic movement because he throws Peter in, in prison. Now James was uh, close to Jesus, as, as we've already said. He was one of the inner three. And you'll remember back in the Gospels in Matthew chapter 20 that the, the mother of James and John had said to Jesus, hey, why, how about you make my sons really important in the kingdom? One can sit on your right and the other can sit on your left. And Jesus had said to the mother of James and John, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And are you able to uh, suffer the baptism with which I will be baptized, referring to his death on the cross? And you'll remember that Jesus went on to say, you will drink my cup. And so James knew that one day he would share in the suffering of Christ. And here it happens, around A.D. 44, under the reign of Herod Agrippa, he is martyred, he is killed. The first record of an apostle, one of the twelve apostles being martyred in the book of Acts. Of course, eleven of the twelve of them will eventually be martyred, and he is killed by the sword. How the church must have grieved, how they must have suffered at the martyrdom of James. But Peter is thrown into prison. And we are told the motivation of King Herod. If you look carefully here, it says he did this because it pleased the Jews in verse 3. Of course, we know the Herods, all of them, not just Agrippa, wanted to please the Jews because if the Jews formed a, a rebellion or an insurrection, then the Romans would remove Herod from power and put someone else there. And so he was supposed to promote peace among the Jews in the region. And yet, don't you see here that in his motivation, we see that it's really the root of a lot of the evil that is taking place. A desire to please man, a desire to please a, a group of men, a group of sinners, 
is a root of all kinds of evil. When you're focused on pleasing man, you are not focused on pleasing God. You're not focused on doing what honors the Lord. And of course, Herod is focused on retaining his power. He's focused on pleasing man in the form of pleasing the Jews. And therefore, he's killing Christians and he's imprisoning Peter. And yet we might ask the question, well, why is it that it unfolds this way? Why does James die? Why is Peter only imprisoned? Uh, why, why didn't they both die? Or why didn't God rescue James like we see in this later passage that God rescued Peter? And the only answer we can give to that is the sovereign hand of God. God permitted King Herod to kill James at this time because it was time for the words of Christ to come true, for him to be baptized with the baptism with which Christ was baptized, to drink the cup of suffering. And it wasn't Peter's time yet for God's reasons. And so this persecution is governed by God. Herod is not the true king. Jesus is on his throne even when this evil stuff is happening. Jesus is ruling. Jesus is reigning. Jesus is not wringing his hands saying, I wonder how I'm going to accomplish my purpose to build my church. No, this is the way that Christ will build his church. Through persecution, through martyrdom, through imprisonment, through difficulty, Christ will advance his church. Persecution is the normal Christian life. Christians in the West don't understand this. We're constantly talking about our religious liberties. We're constantly talking about how we can maintain uh, our freedoms in America. And there's nothing wrong with doing your best in terms of your civic duty to try to preserve that and promote that. But it is abnormal for us to have those liberties. Throughout the history of the church, the church has been persecuted. In fact, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So as American Christians living in 21st century, we've got to recognize that when persecution does come against the church, that is normal. What is abnormal is all the freedoms we have. And so when you see Christians compromising in order to placate an ungodly government, or when you see Christians trying to blend into the secular world, uh, they don't get it. The normal Christian life is persecution. And that's what they experienced in Jerusalem, and that's what we should expect as well. It didn't get better after Stephen was martyred. It got increasingly worse. And Jesus tells us, that the church will be persecuted all the way till his second coming. I don't believe, some Christians believe, that the world's going to get better and better and more and more Christianized. I don't believe that. I believe the Bible teaches that we should expect more and more persecution, more and more opposition, all the more as we approach the second coming of Christ. And if they had it then, we have it now. And we know all the sectors of the church today where Christians are being persecuted. And so we see this ongoing presence of persecution by King Herod. We know that this struggle goes back to Genesis 3.15, where God said that he would put in enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. We saw right in Genesis chapter 4, right after the fall, we see the fallout in that wicked Cain murders righteous Abel. And then throughout the history of the whole Bible, you see the seed of the serpent Unbelievers like Cain persecute the seed of the woman. You see it in the book of Esther, don't you, when Haman plots to exterminate the Jews. You see it with Pharaoh trying to enslave and oppress the children of Abraham. And you see it here in the book of Acts. We saw it earlier when Peter and John were preaching the gospel in Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin came after them. This conflict between the evil seed of the serpent and those who are seed of woman. And this conflict will continue throughout the entire Bible, continue throughout the entire history of the church. And we should realize this ongoing presence. Evil rulers will have their day. That's what's going on here. Nero would have his day. Domitian would have his day. Throughout the history of the church, all of those rulers who've persecuted Christians would have their day by the sovereign permission of God. But notice not only the ongoing presence of persecution here, notice the tremendous power of prayer. 
verse 5, we see how the church responded to the imprisonment of Peter and the beheading of James. Verse 5 says, Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So when Christians were persecuted, they didn't protest in the streets. When Christians were persecuted, they didn't petition the civil authorities to give them greater civil liberties. When Christians were persecuted, they prayed. Of course, it's always easier to get Christians to surround a cause or hold a sign or go to the government than go to a prayer meeting. But in the early church, when they were persecuted and they wanted to see the advance of the gospel, they got together and they prayed. And notice the word that's used in verse 5, earnest prayer. The, the word in the original Greek refers to a muscle that is stretched to its fullest capacity. Earnest prayer, eager prayer, straining prayer was made to God for Peter. Notice that you can see that the prayer is immediately effective. Even before Peter leaves the prison, because notice as Peter is there and imprisoned, he's sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. Sentries are at the door. James, one of his buddies and fellow disciples, has just had his head chopped off, and Peter is asleep. Some guys can sleep anywhere, can't they? But why is he able to sleep in the midst of this awful persecution? Well, I believe it's because the church was praying for him. And he had this peace in the midst of the persecution that even though his outward circumstances were frightening and dangerous, he had a perfect peace that passes all understanding. And that peace came through prayer. We've seen throughout the book of Acts, and we'll see later that Christians do funny things in prison. Later on, when Paul and Silas are in prison for preaching the gospel in Philippi, we find them singing hymns. Of all the things they could be doing in prison, they're singing hymns. You notice after the earthquake happens in that situation in Acts chapter 16, when their shackles come off them, the uh, jailer says, what must I do to be saved? Very few people ask the question, how did he know to ask that he needed to be saved? They were probably talking about being saved, praying about being saved, singing about being saved. That's how he knew, what must I do to be saved? And so Christians can have this peace in the midst of the most horrific situation. And notice that this peace comes while Peter is in prison. It's almost like there's two deliverances that are going on in Peter's life here. You have the deliverance within the prison and the deliverance from the prison. He's delivered in the prison in the sense that he's able to sleep between two soldiers. Maybe he's going to be beheaded the next day. And he's also delivered from the prison as the passage unfolds. But you know what I was thinking about this passage, and I thought, you know, maybe Peter also had peace for another reason. You remember at the end of the Gospel of John, like Jesus had told James that he would die by martyrdom, Jesus had also told the same thing to Peter in John chapter 21. Remember after Peter had denied Jesus three times, Jesus asked him three times, do you love me and feed my lambs, that passage? But in John 21, Jesus said this to Peter, 21 verse 18, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Speaking of death by crucifixion. This he said to, him, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said, follow me. Jesus has already told Peter, you're going to be crucified. Jesus has already told Peter it's going to happen when you're an old man. Peter knows his life is in the hands of God. He knows it's all going to fall out by providence. And so he has this peace that passes all understanding, even in the midst of two soldiers. Did you know that God can give you that same peace no matter what circumstance you're in in life? 
no matter how sick you are, no matter how chaotic things are in your family, no matter how many bad things are being said about you at work. Peace is not perfect circumstances or peaceful circumstances. Peace is the presence of God in the midst of chaotic circumstances. And Peter had the presence of God. But notice this passage is almost humorous, isn't it? Because as Peter is sleeping, an angel shows up and a light fills the whole prison. And that doesn't wake Peter up. And Peter's still asleep and the angel has to go over and kind of, hey, wake up. It's time to get out of here. And the angel has to kick Peter and strike him and say, get up quickly. And you get the impression that Peter is a little bit groggy because it says here that he thinks he's seeing a vision. He's kind of stumbling through the prison, putting on his clothing, getting up. The shackles are falling off. Doors are opening in front of him. He's missing the show. He thinks it's just a vision. And then he gets outside the prison and the angel leaves and he's, he's almost coming to his senses then. And he says, I've been delivered by God's power. And of course, we know that God delivered him because God still had a purpose for Peter on the earth. James, he took up to heaven because James' time was up. But Peter still had a purpose on this earth. Our days are written in God's book, the day of our birth and the day of our death. And God is sovereign over when we're born and when we die. And God has different purposes for everyone, and Peter's purpose is still on the earth. And so God rescues him out of, out of prison, and God brings him out. And this is the second time this has happened to Peter. Remember back earlier on in chapter 5, when Peter was imprisoned by the Sanhedrin, an angel came and opened the prison gates and said, go out into the temple and declare all the words of this life. So this is the second jailbreak Peter has been involved in, and he hasn't done anything. God has been sending these angels to help him. I hope you believe in angels, by the way. We've seen angels throughout the book of Acts. I hope you don't demythologize the Bible and take out the supernatural elements and rationalize it. We believe in angels. They're created spiritual beings. They often appear in the Bible as messengers, but also they are servants that surround those who are saved and provide for them and protect them. God talks about surrounding us with many angels, not just one guardian angel, but many that surround us and protect us daily. Of course, there are extremes when it comes to angels. Some people worship angels, basically. They're always talking about angels. They got angel statues all over their house. But the Bible is very clear that Jesus is above angels. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, Jesus has received a name that is more excellent than angels. And angels prostrate fall before Jesus. So we should believe in angels and know angels are surrounding us, but we worship Jesus and not angels. This angel comes and delivers Peter. And notice what happens when Peter goes to the church. He goes to where he knows the Christians are meeting, Mary's house, not Mary the mother of Jesus, Mary the mother of John Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. And he goes to the gate and he knocks on the door. Servant girl comes, Rhoda. And she's like, it's Peter. She just leaves him there. Runs back inside. Peter's outside. And they're like, yeah, sure. Pat her on the head. Whatever you say, little girl. Others, as she's persistent and emphatic about this, say it's his angel because Jews had this belief that every person had a guardian angel. Man, that angel could appear in your form. And so they're saying you're seeing some kind of spiritual thing. It can't be Peter. Wait a second. Aren't these the Christians who've been earnestly praying for Peter's release? <laughs> Aren't these the Christians who are in that house at that moment praying for Peter? And then Peter shows up and answers their prayer and they're surprised? Aren't we rebuked at times when God answer, answers our prayers and we're surprised that he answers our prayers? Shouldn't we be surprised when he doesn't? He says, you ask. He says, you have not because you ask not. God tells us that, that we have an omnipotent God, a God who's willing to answer prayer, a God who has the power to do abundantly more than we think, ask, or imagine. Why are we surprised when God does supernatural things? It's almost a rebuke to the church that we are surprised when God delivers, whether He delivers us in the prison or from the prison, 
We are surprised when God answers the request of his people. But we should not be surprised. But we should be earnest in prayer like these Christians were. The tremendous power of prayer here is bringing peace to Peter in the midst of chaos. It's bringing deliverance from that which was keeping the gospel shut up. And it's amazing all the people of God. We should be a praying church. I think you could placard that that verse, you have not because you ask not, over many churches. Why don't we see conversions? Why don't we see people growing in their faith? Why don't we see people desiring Christ and having a hunger and thirst for Him? Well, are we earnestly praying for those things? Are we earnestly coming together, falling before God, and crying out for the Lord to work in our midst? The early church did, and the early church saw God working through those means to accomplish His eternal purposes. So you see the ongoing presence of persecution. You see the tremendous power of prayer. But notice also in this passage, you see the eventual judgment of God. The eventual judgment of God. So you have Herod has killed James. Herod has imprisoned Peter. Herod, like all the other Herods before him, is on a rampage. He's laying violent hands on the church. He's he's killing Christians. But Peter has gotten out. And Herod even kills his own men for letting him go. But the passage ends by reminding us of the fate that comes to Herod and the fate that all that comes to all who fight against God eventually. Notice that Herod is angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Those are two cities located north of Israel and Phoenicia. They depend on him for food, so they want to stay in a good relationship with Herod. And so they come before him, and on a special day appointed by Herod, he puts on his royal robes, and he comes out in all the splendor of the king, and he delivers an oration to the people, and of course the people want him to be buttered up so he will continue to provide for them, and they say, oh, it's the voice of a god, and not the voice of a man. And Herod, as often wicked rulers do, receives all the praise. He says, thank you very much. I am very great. I am a God. I am so very wonderful. And immediately the angel of the Lord struck him down. It's interesting in the original. It says angel struck Peter to wake him up and deliver him. And it's the same language the angel struck Herod to bring him down. And he breathes his last and he's eaten by worms and he falls dead to the ground. And notice what it says there. He did not give God the glory. He took the glory to himself. He wanted to please man. He wanted man to make much of him. He wanted to preserve his own power. But he didn't glorify God, and so God brought this immediate and swift judgment Now, how did he die? Well, obviously, the the Bible just says God struck him down. According to Gene Sloat Martin in his book, Science in the Bible, he speculates that maybe this was a rupture of a cyst formed by a tapeworm. So this would explain the eating eaten by worms bit. Josephus, the Jewish historian, writes about the same event in his history, his secular history, in his Antiquity of the Jews, and he adds some other details that are left out of the biblical account. He says this, Now when Agrippa had reigned three years over all Judea, he came to the city of Caesarea, which was formerly called Strato's Tower. And there he exhibited spectacles in honor of Caesar for those well-being. He'd been informed that a certain festival was being celebrated. At this festival, a great number were gathered together of the principal persons of dignity of his province. On the second day of these spectacles, he put on a garment made wholly of silver, of truly wonderful texture, and came into the theater early in the morning. There the silver of his garment, being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays, shone out in worldly manner. And was so resplendent as to spread awe over those that looked intently upon him. 
Presently his flatterers cried out, one from one place and another from another, though not for his good, that he was a god. And they added, Be thou merciful to us, for although we have hitherto reverenced thee only as a man, yet shall we henceforth own thee as superior to mortal nature. Upon this the king neither rebuked them, nor rejected their impious flattery. But he shortly afterward looked up and saw an owl sitting in a certain rope over his head, and he, immediately he understood that this bird was a messenger of ill tidings, just as it had once been the messenger of good tidings to him, and fell into the deepest sorrow. A severe pain arose in his belly, striking with the most violent intensity. He therefore looked upon his friends and said, I whom you call a god am commanded presently to depart this life. While providence thus reproves the lying words you just now said to me, and I who is by, by you called immortal am immediately to be hurried away by death. But I am bound to accept what providence allots as it pleases God, for we have by no means lived ill, but in splendid and happy manner. When he had said this, his pain became violent. So you have there a, a document outside of the Bible that's talking about the same event from a different perspective. It's not Scripture, but it's, giving, it's adding to your understanding of what happened to Herod. He mocked God by taking upon himself the glory that is due only to God. God has a passion for his own glory, and God will not share his glory with any mortal man. And those who ascribe unto themselves the glory that belongs only to God will come under judgment. We see examples of this all throughout our culture today. People who receive praise without giving glory to God. Athletes who thump their chest on the field because of how great they were in the previous play. And yet God is very merciful. He doesn't strike them down for bragging and boasting about abilities that come from His sovereign hand that He could remove in an instant. And yet here God makes an example of Herod to show us the eventual judgment that, come, that comes against those who fight against God. There is a payday someday. There is a day of reckoning. There is a day in which God will eventually make it clear that He is the one who is glorious and great, and not man. And even though Herod was there speaking eloquently, and even though he was there in all of his royal attire, shining in his silvery coat in the splendor of the morning sun, how quickly he came under the judgment of God. We might be reminded in the Old Testament of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was on the roof of his palace, and Daniel had told him that God was going to strike him with madness for his pride. And Nebuchadnezzar was at the top of his palace saying, My, I'm such a great king, and Babylon is so great because I am so great. And immediately God struck him with madness, and he fell to the earth, and he laid in the dew of the grass, and his fingernails grew long, and his hair grew out, and he came under the judgment of God. And so you see examples throughout the Bible of the fact that the Lord will judge his enemies. It's true in the Old Testament, and it's true in the New Testament. There's coming a day where Christ will lay bare His righteous sword, and He will thrust it through all of those who are enemies of the gospel. Christ is not only the meek and mild one who sits on a donkey, but He is the one who treads the winepress of the wrath of God the Almighty. And these earthly temporal judgments, like that which came upon Herod, point to the ultimate final judgment of all those who ally themselves against God, against Christ, against the gospel, and against His people. And we can be patient in the midst of tribulation because we know that Christ will have His way. Evil rulers will have their day, but Christ will have His way. How do we know? Verse 24, right after Herod has died, perhaps his corpse is there with worms crawling out of his eyeballs and his ears and his mouth, and we're told, but the Word of God continued to increase and multiply. Herod's dead. Jesus isn't dead. Herod's laid violent hands on the church. The church is marching forward. The Word of God is increasing. The Word of God is multiplying. And the more fiercely Satan comes against the church, the more the Word of the Gospel spreads.
the more the church grows and the more the kingdom of Christ advances. We see at the end of the passage that Barnabas and Saul get back, connect with John Mark, who is also, we will learn later on, a cousin of Barnabas. And they will eventually be sent off on the first missionary journey to take the gospel to the Gentiles. We look around us and we can be discouraged by the evil rulers who are having their day. You know, you think about the, all the rulers throughout the world who are persecuting Christians, different groups. Some of them are not rulers, but just evil powers. And Christ may permit them to have their day for a season, but in the end, God will have his way. The church will advance. The kingdom of God will fill the earth. And as far as the waters cover the sea, the glory of God will fill the new heavens and new earth. And on that day, you'll see a people from every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping King Jesus. And all the enemies of all the people of God, we are told, will be beneath our feet. There's a passage in the book of Joshua where Joshua leads the armies of Israel to defeat Amorite kings. And then Joshua has them routed out of a cave and he lays them down on the ground and he tells the so the leaders of the armies of Israel to put their heels on the neck of those kings. And he says, this is what God will do to all those who stand against his people. And sure enough, that is a picture of Christ who crushes the head of the serpent and of Christ who is able to overcome all of those who hate his church and that Christ's word will come to pass. And we should be encouraged by that. There's a lot of things to discourage us on the news, right? Uh, Christ hasn't promised that America will last forever, by the way. But Christ has promised that his church will endure forever and that his gospel will endure forever. And so we are to find our hope in Jesus and in him alone. Have you repented of your sins and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone? Have you have come to a point and place in your life where you've truly had a heart change, where you realize that you have allied yourself against God by your sin and you need forgiveness. Repent and trust in Jesus and receive the free gift of everlasting life in Him and be incorporated into His people, a people that will fill the earth as far as waters cover the sea. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promises of your word that you will have a church on the earth, that that church will be persecuted but that that church will never perish. May we be strengthened by that life-giving hope, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Before we sing our final hymn, I wanted to tell you something really interesting about it. It's hymn 422, We Rest on Thee. Uh, I've told you before about Jim Elliott and the four other missionaries who took the gospel to the Aachen Indians and how they were speared to death by those Indians. Elizabeth Elliot tells uh, the story that before they went on the plane over to the tribe that would spear them to death, they sang this hymn that we're about to sing, We Rest on Thee, to the tune Finlandia. And Elizabeth Elliot in particular says that she remembers in her, in her, very vividly her husband, Jim, belting out the final line of this hymn which says, We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. Thine is the battle, thine shall be the praise. When passing through the gates of pearly splendor, victors we rest with thee through endless days. When passing through the gates of pearly splendor, victors we rest with thee through endless days. And so when Elizabeth Elliot wrote her book about the missionary, she called it Through the Gates of Splendor because Jim Elliott and those other missionaries were trusting in the Lord, their shield and defender, but they understood that even in their sacrifice, in their martyrdom, like James' martyrdom, the gospel was still being advanced. So let's remember that as we sing our closing hymn, number 422, We Rest on Thee. Let's stand as we sing.